So thanks very much. And uh, this is a very interesting experiment. I mean, we're starting to have these meetings now, and I think we'll slowly be getting the hang of it, but we have, we're not quite there yet. But it's an exciting experiment, and I'm very pleased to be able to take part in this. So uh, thank you to Bridie and Louise in, in full circle for making this happen. Now, what I'm going to do in my 12 minutes to begin with, and we can return to some of these issues as we go along, is to reflect on the pandemic in the context of overheating, but also in the context of the enforced cooling down that we experienced with a vengeance, brutally and suddenly, uh, just a few weeks ago uh, in, in, in much of the world. Uh, I do not have any final answers to offer. I think that this is a conversation that we need to have about where we're going after the pandemic. And it's a conversation which is only just starting and where it's crucial that we use our humanity, our imagination, uh, our experiences and our knowledge in order to envision what the world could and should look like after the pandemic, because it's not, it's not going to be the same. We've lived in an overheated world now for a long time. By overheating, I do not merely refer to or even primarily refer to climate change, although that's part of the story. Overheating is about speed. Speed and heat in physics are two sides of the same coin. So it's about what I call the acceleration of acceleration, which took off, I mean, roughly around 1990, the end of the Cold War, the coming of the internet, the deregulation of the Indian economy, uh, the advent of the new mobile phones, you know, these things which look now like this, which didn't look like that uh, in the early 90s, but which came into the world and served to enhance efficiency, connectivity, speed, and so on and so forth. Um, so um, that is the kind of world in which we've lived now for about 30 years and where you see all of these indicators, all of the, many of the forms of growth and change and speed that have been with us since the Industrial Revolution suddenly took a, a slight, a, a, a rather sharp turn upwards and started to accelerate. Only since the 1980s, the number of tourist arrivals in the world has doubled, it's, it's, it's increased sixfold, from 200 million to 1.2 billion. Um, air traffic, I mean, uh, civilian air traffic uh, grew uh, only from 2004 to 2019, from 2 billion to 4.5 billion. It more than doubled in just 15 years. And I could have gone on. I could have spoken about energy use, about the growth of cities, about information technologies, and about various forms of mobility, including trade, which has quadrupled since 1980. World trade has quadrupled. It's increased four times. So in other words, we're talking about a, a period of in incredible, unprecedented, accelerated change. The thing about this change, and the reason why I'm calling it not just heating, but overheating, is that there is no thermostat. You see, there is no instance. It's kind of, it's like a furnace, which just gets hotter and hotter and hotter. And there's no instance, no governor, no caretaker or janitor who can walk over to the furnace and turn down the heat. Or a thermostat, which can regulate it automatically. When it reaches 22 degrees, it's fine. You can cool down now. There's no such instance, which means that uh, it's a fairly risky uh, situation, which creates a lot of vulnerability for reasons which are increasingly becoming well known. The most famous side effect, of course, of overheating being global climate change, the paradoxical way in which we undermine the conditions of our own existence, that the causes of our well-being in our parts of the world and in the global middle classes across the planet are exactly the same as the causes of that very uh, way of life's undoing. So what we've experienced now, uh, which I understand and I interpret uh, through an uh, overheating uh, framework is that um, um, uh, it, it, what we've seen is for many years, people, experts, researchers, some politicians, environmental movements, activists, and uh, indigenous groups and so on have been pleading with world leaders to slow down, cool down and scale down. Nothing has happened. Well, symbolic things have happened. Nothing much has happened. It's been business as usual until March uh, 2020, when we were forced to cool down. 
when civilian air traffic, which had more than doubled in just 15 years, was reduced by 94% between March 2019 and March 2020. Just to give you one example, and as you know just as well as me, we have lived through a dramatic change in our way of life. Yes, it is temporary. Yes, it's not going to stay this way. Yes, we will be able to meet physically in Brussels or elsewhere, probably within the next year. But things are not going to be the same again. And uh, I am one of the people who thinks that we can use this opportunity, we can use this window of opportunity to reflect critically on the world that we've created and uh, rethink some of its features. Uh, what we're talking about here uh, is uh, the sudden visibility of all of these invisible threads and networks and movements that held our waves of life, uh, uh, held our ways of life together. It's almost like sort of peering behind the computer program in the matrix, or it's or it's like when you when you walk on the street uh, every day, you walk over. Uh, piping, tubes, you know, uh, all of the uh, uh, plumbing that uh, gives you water in your tap and you never give it a thought before the tap dries, uh, runs dry. And the moment the tap runs dry, you, you, become incredibly, you become incredibly interested in where the water is coming from. Uh, and this is exactly what's happening with globalization. Suddenly, we see the scaffolding, uh, we, we see all of the uh, trappings or, and the infrastructure of globalization, which has been invisible to most of us until now. So it's a window through which we can see ourselves and the conditions that produce us and raise some critical questions about uh, where we want to go. Uh, and one of the ways uh, in which we see uh, this is through butterfly effects. The, uh, uh, the vulnerabilities of globalization. The butterfly effect, you know, the, the anecdote of the butterfly flapping its tiny wings somewhere in Brazil. Uh, so creating a very, very, very faint sort of a stream of air, which mixes with the larger stream of air, changes the direction of that and so on and so forth. And before you know it, there's a blizzard in New York and a hurricane in the Caribbean. You know, that's a short version of the butterfly effect. How small causes can have very large effects as an illustration of interconnectedness and of vulnerability. So what happened now is that, uh, you know, somewhere, you know, somewhere in Wuhan probably, someone probably who was buying or who was just soliciting a purchase uh, in the market uh, of Wuhan got unlucky. So he got infected with a disease which seemed like a flu. And a few months later, people who run tourist businesses in Svalbard, in the far Arctic North, north of Norway, are going bankrupt because there are no longer any tourists. Airlines are grounded. Uh, people talk about the shrinking of the economy by a factor of 30%, but nobody really knows. And, uh, and we're still in a liminal stage here when it comes to both the disease as such and its long-term effects. We don't really know. So this is the time to think about uh, alternatives. We've had global crisis before. Um, we've had global pandemics before. The Black Death, which indirectly or partly led to the end of feudalism and uh, the heralding of the modern world and which uh, enabled eventually the Ottomans to take over most of North Africa and, and the Middle East. No small feat for a disease. We've seen the, uh, for Europeans, trivial diseases that were exported to the Americas after the conquest in 1492, which led to the virtual eradication of the native populations of the Americas and leading to uh, a much easier situation for people who, uh, who were the settler colonialists. And so we've, so we've seen this before. We've seen how big pandemics can have lasting historical consequences. And I'm convinced that at the moment we are living through a, a moment of world historical significance. Obviously, being in the middle of it, we don't know where it's going to end. But that's, to some extent, it's up to us how it's going to end. We've had other global crises recently, and we have one currently, the climate crisis, which shares some characteristics. It says something about interconnectedness and about global vulnerability, that we are one humanity and we're in this together. But it, it also has some traits which it does not share with the, with the COVID-19 pandemic, namely speed. It's much slower, it's sluggish, it's gradual, and it comes with stealth indirectly and uh, you know, in, a, in a gradual way, whereas this uh, disaster came super fast and, and suddenly. Now, so what are the possibilities? Uh, I have notes, 
I'm not going to uh, go through all of them because I'm running out of time. So I'll just skip what I was going to say about the dangers of uh, xenophobic nationalism as, an, as a sort of instinctive reaction to this virus, which comes from the outside, which is Chinese or European or whatever, uh, of which we've seen signs, not only in the, in the United States, uh, not only in Europe, but also in Africa, in Ghana, for example, where there has been instances of, uh, you know, uh, xenophobic reactions to Europeans because Europeans were the ones who brought the coronavirus to Ghana. I'm not going to talk about that now, but maybe we can discuss it later on. The relationship between nationalism on the one hand and the more cosmopolitan global humanism on the other as a, uh, an ideological outcome of the corona crisis. But let me end by saying just a couple of things about some of the positive uh, possibilities that might emerge out of this crisis, which of course at the moment is painful, it's difficult, it's worrying and it's unwanted. And there are some immediate problems that need to be solved to do with employment, uh, to do with precarity, to do with poverty and so on and so forth, not least in the global south. So by all means, let us not underestimate those problems. But following this, Maybe we should do things differently. Maybe we should think more in terms of a human economy than in terms of a neoliberal capitalist economy. Maybe we should uh, rethink the self-destructive aspects of global neoliberalism, the way in which we are, as I was saying uh, at the outset, we are undermining the conditions of our own existence uh, through environmental destruction and uh, over-exploitation of resources, the way in which we, in the space of just a few generations, are burning off um, fossil fuels, fossil resources that it took the planet, you know, 60 million years or more to produce. Uh, rather irresponsible. Perhaps we should talk less about human rights and more about human duties. There are many options here. And the point, my point is that now we have this window of opportunity because we have a liminal stage where there is uncertainty and there is anxiety and lots of people worry for the future and we can create the future ourselves. And it can be an improvement related to what was before. So thank you for now and I hope to be able to return to some of these topics during the discussion.